Good morning. Welcome to Grace Bible Fellowship Church, where it is so difficult to get people to stop greeting one another. You know what? If that's our worst problem, we, we got it made. Praise God. Worship was good today, at least for me. We're about to go into a section of Luke, which you're probably very familiar with, and there's always the danger of hearing something familiar again, and you're like, oh, Pastor Dave, I already know this. I've read through this a million times. Perhaps you have, but I would really like to know which one of you does it perfectly, because I need to be, I need to be trained by you, because I was very convicted going through this section of Scripture. If we call ourselves Christians and we say that we follow Jesus Christ as our Savior, we believe that the Bible is the Word of God, we have submitted our lives to Him and His teaching. Amen? Amen. Okay, guys, just wondering if you're following. And so, because of that, when we read this book, this is the Word of God. It's not, uh, you know, like some people say, the Ten Suggestions. You know, it's not, it's not, they're the Ten Commandments. And, you know, the rest of the scripture is the same. And it comes from an authoritative, loving God who knows exactly what's right for us and good for us because he created us. And when we do what he says, things work out really, really well. And when we don't, things don't work out so well. That's just the bottom line. So as we get into this, please pray with me. Father, as we open your word, we need you. Amen. Lord, we need your strength. Because in and of ourselves, we just don't have it. To do the things that you ask us to do, to do the things that you command us to do, that are evidences that you're in our life is just something we can't do in and of our own flesh. And so, Lord, we come before you humbly, hungry, for more of you that you might help us. So Lord, be with our minds and our hearts as we hear your word. Help me and help us to see you. In Jesus' name, amen. Luke 6.31, and just as you want men to do to you, you also do to them likewise. Well, that's easy enough. Let's see. <laughs> What do I want you guys to do for me? Uh -oh. Let me see. Because that's what I should do for you. So what, what is it I would like you guys to do for me? We like that thought. And then when you remember that Jesus says, that's what you should do to others, you suddenly bring down your <laughs> expectations of what you want other people to do for you because you realize you're going to have to do it for them. Boy, I would, I would like a, a free trip to Hawaii. I would like unlimited funds. I would like a memory that is perfect in every way. I want to be worshipped, admired. I want to be... We, you know, we, we get these things in our mind, and, and then how far do you go? And if, and if that's what you wish for other people to do for you, then you should be doing that for everyone else. And because we're really not that different, all of us, there are things that we desire. And yet, instead of thinking of this scripture, we just think about us and what we want. And we don't think that because it's something we want, it's something we should do for others. It's that rail that we don't tend to switch on to re very readily, at least I don't. You know, um, Somebody asked me yesterday, Pastor Dave, you hungry? <laughs> I'm always hungry. <laughs> yes, why yes. Were you planning on going out to lunch? Well, yeah, yeah, I was. Well, you want to go? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I do. That was somebody who was probably hungry. 
And you see how that works when you do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. It's, it's this wonderful reciprocative relationship and living in a fellowship, living in a family as we do, that's how Christians work. That's how life is. You desire and you look to the needs of others, preferring them above your own. And when we do that, boy, it's a, it's a beautiful life. They say that heaven and hell are like two tables, identical, and no one has elbows. Everyone in hell is trying to get food in their mouth, throwing things up, and they're just covered in food, and they're just miserable because they can't seem to get any in their mouth. And then everyone in heaven is plump, satisfied, because we feed one another. And that's, the, that's just the difference between the church and the rest of the world. And so if that's the case, what I would have done unto me is, is the way I should be treating you. I never plan what I'm going to say, but there it is. <laughs> Last couple of weeks, we've been looking in Luke chapter 6, verses 1 to 19. We looked at Jesus and the Sabbath. We saw about eating, or what the Pharisees deemed as threshing and winnowing and processing food, and also healing on the Sabbath. And we see Jesus just says, you guys have no idea what you're talking about. You've raised your traditions up above the word of God and the intention of God's word. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And so we saw that last week we were in Luke chapter 6, 12 to 26, and we saw him choosing the 12 disciples and him sitting down and beginning to teach them. And he explains to them that there are some conditions that they should be in the middle of that you and I also are in the middle of. He talks about poverty and riches, which is our, the flexing of our ability and power and choice. And he says, blessed are you if you're poor now, because you will be rich. Blessed are you who are hungry now, because you will be satisfied. So he's talking about all blessed conditions, and it's talking about physical, but it's more than that, it's spiritual. Blessed are you if you are poor in spirit, where you're crying out to God for more of him, when you realize your own shortcomings and you're hungry for him, when you weep over your physical condition, over your sinful condition, and that there are things that you don't seem to be able to get a handle on and things that you wish you did have a handle on. And then if you're well-liked by everyone, which is usually something that people enjoy, then you should really be worried about that. Because if everybody likes you, well then you're just like the false prophets who've come before. So Jesus says, you're blessed when people hate you, when they despitefully use you, when they speak evil against you, for his name's sake. Not because you, you did crazy things or stupid things, but because of Jesus. And Jesus says, you're blessed in all of these situations where you think this is a deficit. This is not a deficit. This makes you closer to God and it gives you a better life. And so we, we looked at that last week. We ended with verses 24 and 26 of chapter 6. But woe to you who are rich, for you've received your consolation. In other words, those of you who you think you know enough, you've got enough. Hey, I don't need your Jesus. I'm okay. Woe to you who are full. In other words, I know enough. I don't need to read the scriptures any longer. I can get along without praying and without going to church and without reading the word. For you shall hunger, because that will bring about a hunger. And woe to you who laugh now. In other words, you, you find it casual and easy to laugh at the hardships of others. For you shall mourn and weep, because they will come upon you at some point. And woe to you when all men speak well of you, for so they did the fathers to the uh, did their fathers to the false prophets. So be careful that these things that we think of as aims and ends in our life aren't the ultimate ends of your life, because they don't bring any real satisfaction. What brings satisfaction is actually in our spirit to be on the other end. So we spoke about that last week. This week we're going to look at Jesus continuing to teach the, uh, teach the disciples 
you'll find it's very familiar to you. You'll find it in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. It's called the Sermon on the Mount, uh, although Jesus here is at a flat place. And it seems like it's almost word for word in some areas and in other areas it's not. But I'll just read through it. Verse 27, but I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who spitefully use you. To him who strikes you on one cheek, offer the other also. And from him who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who asks of you. And from him who takes away your goods, do not ask them back. Just as you want men to do for you, you also do for them likewise. But if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those for whom you hope to receive back, what credit is that to you? For even sinners lend to sinners and receive as much back. But love your enemies. Do good and lend, hoping for nothing in return. And your reward will be great. And you will be sons of the Most High. For he is kind to the unthankful and evil. Therefore be merciful just as your father also is merciful. So as you can see, we have some very light scriptures for this morning. <laughs> Basically, he's talking about love and how we exercise love and how we treat one another. I want you to remember that he's talking to the disciples. He's not expecting this of the world. He's expecting this of us. Because try to throw that on somebody who doesn't know Jesus. Try to put that on somebody that doesn't have the Spirit of God at work in their heart, and uh, they'll think you're crazy. Love, according to Merriam-Webster, is a feeling of strong or constant affection for a person. The strong affection felt by people who have a romantic relationship. <laughs> that is not love. They're lying to you. And every February they tell you this. It's not this. This is not love. To be loving is what the scripture says. It's a deep commitment to another's best good. A deep commitment to another's best good. Now, I don't know where I got that definition, but it seems to be the, the most awesomest de definition to me. Because that means that I am seeking out after your best good and I have a deep commitment to do that before God. It's a covenantal thing I got where I want to do what's right for you, for what's best for you. And sometimes what's best for a child is a spank. <laughs> Just saying. And sometimes we're like children. Sometimes the best thing is to help somebody. Sometimes the best thing to do for somebody is not to help them. It has nothing to do with a strong, constant affection and a feeling. It's a decision. When you stand up at the altar and you commit yourself to share your life with another person in marriage and you make those commitments, it's about all the things you're going to do. It's not about how you're going to feel. I will feel constant affection for you. No, you won't. You make people lie. <laughs> I make people lie if I marry them and get them to make commitments that they will always feel loving. I won't make people lie. A deep commitment to another's best good. And if, if you wonder if it's true, try it. <laughs> Love is therefore an act of the will and not of the emotions. Love and acting in a loving fashion has nothing to do with how you feel. That takes all the air out of it, doesn't it? Just, oh, great. It's not a duty like, when I go home, my wife's not feeling well, I'm going to bring her flowers because I must. Because it's a loving act. You see, it's not devoid of your heart, but you see, it's driven by a deep commitment for another's best good. It's not about me. It's about others. 
and it's a really difficult thing to wrap your head around, but this is what the scripture teaches. So before we go through this, it's a good idea to be reminded what real love is and what the world's telling you. You need to feel good about everybody all the time. That is not what the scripture says. That's why it says, but I say to you who hear, love your enemies. That's how you can love somebody that you don't like. Your enemy is somebody you don't like, or you disapprove of the way they're treating you, or you feel maligned or misused, right? Those are your enemies? Are those your enemies? Sometimes I'm my own worst enemy. I haven't broken into conversation with myself yet, but (laughs) love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you and pray for those who spitefully use you. I feel used. I feel abused. I feel disregarded. I feel dishonored. I feel disappointed by somebody. I need to love them. That's what, that's what Jesus is teaching. I need to love them. How long do you think it is until you begin praying for somebody that you're angry at before the anger goes away? It's therapy, boys and girls. I'm telling you, this is therapy right here. You don't need to to spend big dollars going somewhere. Listen to what the scripture teaches. Are you kidding me? Now, if you're not a Christian and you don't understand the power of God inside of you and you haven't experienced that, then you're going to say, what? And you're going to be just in disillusionment. I can't believe you're actually teaching people this, Pastor Dave. You can't mean this. Well, Jesus said it. Just to remind you, just to show you what true love is, love suffers long. In 1 Corinthians 13, you know that nice passage that they read at all the weddings? Love suffers long. If you are in a relationship with anyone else, you must suffer long. If you've married someone, you will suffer long. It's true. And if you're single, you know what I'm talking about. Love suffers long and is kind. By the way, it's not a feeling. It's an action. Love suffers. That's an action. It's not a feeling. Love does not envy. It's a decision. Love does not parade itself. It is not puffed up. It does not behave rudely. It does not seek its own. It is not provoked. They're all actions. It thinks no evil. Love does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. In other words, if we are made in the image of God, which we are, and if we have been born again by the Spirit of God, which we have, if you claim Jesus Christ to be your Savior and Lord, then you are a changed person, and this is your life. Toward even your enemies, those who hate you, those who spitefully use you. A lot of gulping going on in here. It says that I'm to love, I'm to do good, I'm to bless, and I'm to pray. There's your, there's your to-do list. As a Christian, you don't get to pick the ones that you love. And that might make you make a face. You don't get to pick the ones that you love they usually pick you. And the most annoying of them will find you out. And you might even be related to them or be living with them. You don't get to pick them because that would be easy. You pick all the healthy, emotionally healthy and spiritually strong people and you have them around you. You go, this is a great life. But they will find you. And God will help them to find you so that you learn how to do this. So, a deep commitment to another's best good. I know I'm repeating myself. That's what love really is. If you remember in Luke 10, Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan. There was a a good law-abiding guy who said, listen, what do we have to do, you know, to uh, enter the kingdom of heaven? He goes, well... You know what the scripture says. He says, well, what, what's your reading of it, Jesus? He says, well, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbors yourself. 
And he says, you're right. You, you, you got it. But who's my neighbor? Wanting to be justified, one of the scribes said. But technically, I'd, I'd like to take this down. Who exactly is my neighbor? Can I have the categories? And Jesus tells a story of a man who was mugged, beaten up, and left for dead on the side of the road. And three people go by. The first two just kept going. They saw, went around, and kept going. The third one, who comes from a questionable heritage, from a questionable land, comes by, finds this person, binds up their wounds, puts them on his own donkey, and presumably he's walking with this injured person, brings him to a hotel, pays the manager in advance and extra, and says, take care of this guy, and when I come back, which means he's going to come back, I will take care of anything else that happens. And Jesus asked the question, which one of these was a neighbor to the man who fell? That's what Jesus is asking us to do. And I don't know about you, but that, that goes against the selfish grain of, of my upbringing and my understanding. To him who strikes you on one cheek, offer the other also. I don't know if you've ever been smacked in the face. I've had a few. And from him who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who asks of you, period. <laughs> and from him who takes away your goods, do not ask for them back. Have you ever loaned like a garden shovel out <laughs> or a lawnmower or something to your neighbor or a book or something? And every time you see that person, you're like, hey, where's my stuff? The Bible says don't do that. Hey, remember that time I did that thing for you? Remember that thing? Yeah, well, I need a favor now. The Bible says don't ever do that. Why? Why do we have to do this? Certainly letting somebody strike me and get away with it is not anything that I feel like doing. And I can put them down. Three moves. No breath in your lungs. It's all done. They taught me well in the military. Don't do it. So why would Jesus ask us to be doormats? Why would Jesus ask us to get walked on, to get abused, physically abused? Well, was he physically abused for you? As though you were the one abusing him? Yes, I too am bewildered, disoriented, perplexed, unclear, unsure, lost, and confused. This is difficult stuff. How many of you find difficulty with this? Just you people in the middle. Okay. Well, I'm going to talk to you because you're like me. Somebody's going to inflict pain or dishonor upon me, and I'm supposed to endure it, but also give them an open door to do it again. That just does not shore up with what I've been taught. If somebody's going to sue you and they got a lawsuit against you or they're going to extract something from you legally, it says that you don't give them just the thing that they're suing you for, you give them more. Why? Why would Jesus want us all poor and beaten? I mean, this, this comes to my mind. It says to give to everyone who asks of you, period. Give to everyone that asks of you. I'm going to ask you guys the craziest things as soon as service is over. <laughs> hey, you know what I want you to get for me or do for me? You have to do it because I just taught this. <laughs> I now have power. I would never do that. Give to all those who ask of you. And from him who takes away your goods, do not ask for them back takes away your goods, don't ask for them back. If you're still waiting for that shovel to come back, don't. Get another one. And maybe your neighbor will see that one and say, hey, you got a new shovel. Can I borrow that one? 
you will be tested. <laughs> Do you really follow Jesus or are you just like going to the air conditioned shirt and, in, in the church and having a comfortable seat and listening to a sermon? Matthew 5, 38, 39, we get Matthew's perspective on it. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for tooth. But I tell you not to resist an evil person. That means you'll never argue. But whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn him the other also. So Matthew picks up this nice little tidbit, not to resist an evil person. Not to resist an evil person. You mean I won't ever have to wrestle anyone to the ground? I won't ever have to convince somebody that they're a moron? Or, you know, I don't... No. That's not for us to do. And the very fact that it rages in my heart tells me that I haven't, I haven't been fixed completely. So, you get, a, you get a slap in the face, and you literally are to turn the other cheek, th these cheeks... You're to turn the other cheek, which means you offer to them the other side. If, if this was good for you, wait till you get to the other side. That's what the scripture teaches. I don't know about you, but this makes some people very angry just to be studying this section of scripture because they don't want to do it. And I'm all about defending myself and there's no way you're going to get, huh, I got... I might be fat, but I got lightning <laughs> reactions, okay? And Jesus says, no, don't do that. That's not what I'm about. That's not what a Christian does. And just as you want men to do to you, you also do to them, likewise. Where we get our scripture for the day, which we put on the front. So whatever I want you to do to me, I need to do to you. Well, I need to think about that. This one involves your emotions, your will, and your imagination. I don't know about you guys, but the imagination can be a very dangerous thing because you can imagine all sorts of things. And in the middle of the night when I'm sleeping, I do. I, I have a recurring uh, dream uh, or a series of dreams that I can fly. All I have to do is lean into the wind and up I go. It's, it's wonderful. I love that. I love those dreams. And I actually control my body. I'm moving around. It's, it's wonderful. I love it. I love it. But how do I want to be treated? Well, that's how I should treat other people. Well, how do you want to be treated? What's the deepest need of your soul that it cries out for? Is it security? Is it comfort? Is it love? Is it honor? Respect? Whatever it is, that's what you should be giving away. But if you're the one who's desiring, it might be that you're low on that. So how are you going to give it away? Aha. That's where you have to be walking in the Spirit. Because the Spirit of God will give you the strength to be able to give away that which you do not even possess. And all kinds of religions actually have something very much like this. You've got the... the You've got Hillel, you've got Confucius, you've got all of these guys which say something like this, but you'll notice it's very, you know, that which is hateful to you, do not do to your fellow man. That is the entire law, the rest is commentary. That's actually Hillel, uh, the famous rabbi. Um, you get to Confucius and he says, what, whatever is not good for other people, then you shouldn't, uh, whatever's not good for you, then don't do it for others but they're almost always couched in the negative. Don't do what you wouldn't want done to you. Jesus turns it around and he says, what you would have people do to you, you do that. You see, that's a positive. It's not hold yourself back from doing the negative thing that you don't want done to you, but do what you want people to do to you. It's revolutionary. And I'll tell you what, if... If you really take this ball and run with it, it'll change your life. If you start thinking about what you can do for other people, how you can bless them. Well, let me see, what would, what would bless me? You know, and then I'm going to do that for other people because I know they'll enjoy it. I'm getting a power saw for my wife on Christmas <laughs> and a chainsaw, and I got a whole list of things. You see, that's cheating. 
So that's what we're to do. Because that's what he did. Jesus came to take care of our greatest need. And that which he enjoyed, which is fellowship with his father, he purchases for us by taking all of the flack that we could give him. And he still does. Is he patient with you? Yes. He's still patient with me. And he hasn't given up on me, although I would have given up on me a long time ago. Interesting turn. Jesus says, but if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? So you might not agree with loving your enemies or those who despitefully use you and those who slap you and all that. Okay, well, then what you're left with is giving love to other people who love you back. Actually, that's what the satanic Bible says. Love people that love you. It's a, it's a good thing. It's a trade, you see. It's not really a covenant and it's not a commitment for the other's best good. What it is, it's an agreement. I'll be good to you. You do. I'll play nice with you. You play nice with me. Okay? I get you a Christmas present. You get me a Christmas present. I get you a birthday card. You get me a birthday card. How does that make you different than anyone else? Everybody does that. Sinners, murderers, adulterers. They all do that. So he says, if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those in whom you hope to receive back, you see there's a hope, you don't really know, what credit is that to you? For even sinners lend to sinners who receive as much back. I say, so what? Yeah, that's the way the world works. I don't, I don't do good to people that don't do good back to me because it, it keeps all my stuff from people who are more worthy. <laughs> oh, I have all kinds of little rationalizations that go on that I won't tell you about. I'll just let some of it leak out. So what credit, it's an interesting word. Don't you feel like Superman when you do something nice for somebody, but you know they're going to, like you take somebody out to lunch, you, you know they're going to take you out to lunch. You know, it's just the way it is. That's what we do. You have somebody over your house, you, you know that means you're going to go to their house next. Because there's this sense of obligation, right? When, when somebody does something nice for you, you have this sense of obligation, you want to return the favor. Don't you? I do. But still, I feel like Superman when I do it. Hey, what do you, you want to go to lunch? Let's have lunch. It's on me. Why aren't you picking up homeless people and taking them to lunch? Oh, yeah. What about total strangers? What about people that despitefully use you? What about people who hate you? What about your enemy? Take them to lunch. So maybe you don't feel like Superman or Wonder Woman. Sinners do the same thing. You shouldn't feel so great about it because you know there's a reciprocation. The scripture tells us that we should sacrifice, that we should do good, and we should give. Those are characteristics of a Christian. And there aren't any strings attached. You let it go. You give it and let it go. Yeah, that's how I feel about it. Usually the question is, what's in it for me? Because you'll notice this interesting term. He says, what credit is that to you? What credit? He says it three times. What credit is that to you? We're building credit? What kind of credit are you building and what in the world would you use it for? Your testimony will be listened to when you do this. People will know that you have an extraterrestrial love when you do this. People will see that you have a relationship with the living God who shows patience with them every day by not squashing them like a bug. That's the credit you get. Your testimony has some weight when you do that. That's the credit you get. But love your enemies. Do good and lend, hoping for nothing in return. 
And your reward will be great, by the way, not in this life necessarily. And you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the unthankful and evil. Therefore, be merciful, just as your father also is merciful. There's a family resemblance when you do this. You look like Jesus. You behave like Jesus. And maybe looking in the mirror, you'll get to see that you've been doing things inspired by the Spirit of God, strengthened by his power to do this. And to the world, you look like Jesus. That's the credit you get. I'm not sure how you spend it. It says in 2 Corinthians 3.18, but we all with unveiled face beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory just as by the Spirit of the Lord. We are being transformed. We are right now the light of the world, Jesus said. We're the salt of the earth. That's who we are. And if they don't see Jesus in us, they probably won't see Jesus. And they're going to see when we can do this, because this is a miracle for a human being to be more concerned about giving than receiving and having no strings attached. That's a miracle. Proverbs 25, 21 to 22 says, and if your enemy is hungry, give him bread to eat. And if he is thirsty, give him water to drink. For so you will heap coals of fire on his head and the Lord will reward you. Now, when I grew up, I was taught that you'll kill somebody with kindness, that you set their hair on fire if you're nice to them. It'll burn them up. It'll make them mad. Ooh, I like that. <laughs> I'm inspired to be nice to you to make you mad. That's not what it means at all. People used to... You don't light a fire on the Sabbath, by the way. You're not supposed to go, chuk, 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 take flint and sit there and work up effort and, and, and make a fire. You're not supposed to do that according to the Old Testament because that's work. So you know what? Keep your fire burning. Throw a couple logs extra on there and make sure it keeps burning. But sometimes people's fireplace would go out, which was their source of food, which was their source of heat, which was their source of light. All the things that Jesus gives spiritually, so what you'd have to do is go knock on your neighbor's door and borrow some of their coals. They would put them into a bowl or into a, a, an earthen vessel, and then they would put it on their head and they'd carry it home. And usually there's a little thing, a little donut they kind of wear so it stays centered because the head's not designed for that. And so what you do is you heap coals of fire on their head because what you do is you relight their furnace. You give them the ability to eat. You give them light when the light's gone out. That's what you do. And the scripture, even in the Old Testament, tells us to do that in Proverbs. So loving. Judge not, and you shall not be judged. Condemn not, and you shall not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. And then he spoke a parable to them. Can the blind lead the blind? Will they not both fall into the ditch? The disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is perfectly trained will be like his teacher. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not perceive the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, brother, let me remove the speck that is in your eye, when you yourself do not see the plank that is in your own eye? Hypocrite. First remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck that is in your brother's eye. Judging. I'm sure none of you have this struggle. I do. I am one of the most judgmental people that I have to live with. I am. <coughs> Judge not and you shall not be judged. You know, that's not just before God, but it's also before other people. 
If you're a critical person, people will be critical on you. If you're somebody that's fault-finding on other people, people will be fault-finding on you. They might not say it, but they're thinking it. Judge. The word judge here means to pronounce an opinion about right or wrong. I do this all the time. I went to the store the other day, and somebody was all cattywampus, not even, you know, on the line, you know, parked out of the place where they should be parked. I'm like, they shouldn't have a license. I'm judging. I see somebody, you know, speeding, not using their directional. You're not using your directional. Nope. I'd pull you up. I'd pull you over, right? You would tick it. <laughs> if it were my job, but it's not my job. Too fast, too slow. Get off my tail. Distracted driver. Get off your cell phone. To condemn, it means to presume moral authority to pronounce guilt. Judging is putting yourself in a position to make condemning statements. I do this all the time, guys. I'm just going to confess to you that I struggle with this. This is what I look like when I'm driving. Because what I see is bizarre things. Like, do you know that an inflatable pool is also deflatable? <laughs> There's only so much that I can handle when I'm driving on the roads here in New Jersey. And it's not New Jersey, it's anywhere. I'm just judgmental. I mean, you're eating, you're drinking, you're on your cell phone and smoking and putting on makeup. I mean, how do you, how, I understand multitasking is something to be, a, you know, risen to and we should all try, but not while driving. And I am just full of judgment, man. God help me. And I don't want to be judged because you know what? I have to confess. Sometimes my phone goes, loop, and I figure I'm in a nice place on the road. Who is that? I do the same thing. Oh, God, help me. I picked it up the other day, and the Lord said, uh, uh. I was like, you're right. I got to preach the sermon. I got to. <laughs> so I need to be reminded of all of this stuff. Do not judge. Why? Because you're not a judge. You're not a judge. You are not in authority over everyone. You're not God's cop. You're not the Holy Spirit police. I think I am. <laughs> Showing love is a deep commitment to others' best good. Which means I should not have thoughts of running people off the road or scaring them into an accident. You know, somebody's on the phone and doing this and you just go, beep, and they go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I got a thousand and one thing. My imagination works overtime. Do not judge, or you shall be judged. I don't want to be judged by God in the way I judge other people. I don't want to be judged by you in the way that I judge you, at least in my mind. I mean, some of y'all don't know how to park. <laughs> Which is why when I park out there, you couldn't get a bicycle. That's why I do that. Because I'm judgmental. I don't want any of y'all judging me. So if I'm an inch away from that wall, that's good. That's what I aim for. There's just a way to do it. I get to practice it all week. But you won't see me there on Sunday. I parked up the road. That's why I look out the window. I see you go there and say, yeah, you're not handicapped. What are you parking here for? <laughs> There's a spot right behind me around the block over there. You want to park? <laughs> Do not judge. Or you'll be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. 
Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. If you are like me and struggle with being judgmental and condemning, you will be judged and condemned by God and by others. I need lots of grace. How about you? So I'm going to give boatloads of grace to you guys because I need it. Forgive, which means to set fully free, to let go, to dismiss to liberty. It means let it go. Some of us have trouble forgiving. Let it go. Because you're being an example of how God should forgive you. And if you have received Jesus Christ as your Savior and all of your sins have been washed away, you have no right to hold anything against anyone. Because before a holy God, from head to toe, we're just useless. And he forgave us and loved us and sent his only son for us. Why can't we forgive somebody else who's a fellow sinner like us? To give means to grant, to deliver, to furnish, to supply. The, ca- the Christian life is characterized by giving. And I don't know about you, but I grew up poor, so I don't, I don't like to give anything out. But when I do, I like to do it secretly so nobody knows about it. Or people start patting me on the back. Charity is the art of living generously. You want to live generously towards other people, both in the way that you show grace and forgiveness, but also the way that you actually supply their needs. And the scripture tells us that God loves a cheerful giver. Actually, the word is hilarion, where we get the word hilarious. He loves a hilarious giver. In Acts 20, verse 35, Paul says, and remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. How many of you believe that's true? With the right heart, it is. And by the way, do any of you know where Jesus said that in the Bible? You won't find it. A little trivia. Love is a deep commitment to another's best good. That's what love is. And that's what all of this is about. That's why we don't judge. And he spoke a parable to them. He said, can the blind lead the blind? Will they not both fall into the ditch? A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who's perfectly trained will be like his teacher. What Jesus is saying is if you do what the rest of this world is doing, you're like blind person trying to tell another blind person what to do. This is required for you to be able to give vision to somebody else. And if you're a, if you're a disciple of Jesus Christ, you will begin doing these things. It will flow out of you and you will find out that it's true. Instead of saying, listen, you don't know how to park. Let me show you how it's done. (laughs) That's somebody who is like the blind leading the blind. And sometimes we do that when we start telling people about Jesus and then we act unbecomingly and not in accordance with what the scripture teaches us. And Jesus says, and why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not perceive the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, brother, let me remove the speck that is in your eye when you yourself do not see the plank that is in your own eye? Hypocrite. First remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck that is in your brother's eye. This is one of my favorite passages because To be a judge, that means you got things that are wrong in your heart and you're just finding things wrong with other people so you're avoiding the issue. The most gracious people that I know, the most humble people that I know are not judgmental. Because you know what? They're living the life and they don't have a plank hanging out of their eye and they realize they have no right to judge, to stand and point the finger and condemn because they're living in a humble dependent life upon the spirit of God. 
James 4, 11 and 12 says, do not speak evil of one another, brethren. He's not speaking to the world. He's speaking to you and me. Do not speak evil of one another. He who speaks evil of a brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and destroy. Who are you to judge another? You see, we all live our lives before the very face of God. And if he sees your mess and he doesn't lower the hatchet on you, what makes me think I have a right to? Romans 2.1 says, Therefore you are inexcusable, O man, whoever you are who judge. For in whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. There's some things that I just don't like, like being late. I hate being late. That's why I come early. Because if you're not early, you're late. It's one of those things. Because I don't want to be judged. Shame on me. Because I don't want to be judged. And I want to have the right to judge you. So I'm going to be here early so I can look at all of you late people. Yeah, hey, glad you can make it today. Thanks. You see? And I imagine if I'm struggling with it, you probably are struggling with it too. I mean, I go into the bathroom. I look on the floor. There's a piece of paper towel. Why didn't the person that tore it off not bend over, pick it up, and throw it away? Then I go to pull the paper towel and it goes and it rips in my hand. And I think, who is the bonehead who filled this paper towel dispenser up all the way to the top? So there's like 25 pounds of weight. So I can't pull one paper towel because the whole thing is heavy. I'm full. Of, then I go to the sink and I put myself up against the sink to wash my hands and I get wet. Who in the world washed their hands like a pig in this sink and put, and look, the mirror's got water on it. What's going on here? When what I should have done was picked up the paper, fix the paper towel holder, wipe down the sink and the mirror and left and said, thank you, Lord, that I could be of use to you today. Do you, do you guys feel me? Good, I'm not alone. Thank you. Romans 14.10 says, but why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. We're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account of the things that we do in the body. So why can't I have grace? Because you can't give away what you haven't received. And I need to continually remind myself that Jesus died for me if I was the only person on the planet. And he still loves me spite of all my foolishness. Romans 14, 4 says, Who are you to judge another servant? To his own master he stands or falls. That makes lots of sense. Indeed, he will be made to stand for God is able to make him stand. In the midst of judging, you don't think that you might actually be used as an instrument of God to bring repair and change and restoration? Because it's so convenient to judge. And it's very inconvenient to have to throw yourself into the mix and actually fix the problem. Finding problems is easy. Repairing problems is a much bigger thing. And that's what Jesus asks us to do by loving our enemies by giving to those who ask. Loving and judging. That's basically what this was about. I'd like to end with a poem for those of you that enjoy that sort of art. What is that little speck I spy, that teeny spot in your right eye? Is it grime? Is it slime? Or is that tiny fleck a fly? I also see a Clube of goop. 
Thank you. <laughs> the judgmentals. I also see a glob of goo, a yellowish green like split pea soup. The icky goo is thick as glue and it makes your eyelids sort of droop. And on your lash is just a hint of fuzzy wuzzy laundry lint. I bet that's why you rub your eye and always wink and squint. As long as I'm on a roll, I'll carry on with my spec control. I think you were, what is that you ask? What's in my eye? Oh, that's just a 10 foot pole. God help us. God help us. So, I have two words of wisdom after all of this silliness. Let's get busy showing real love and showing people and being a demonstration of God's love towards other people. Amen? Amen. It is a deep commitment to another's best good. I realize that I'm not on track when I'm not doing that. And number two, retire from the bench. <laughs> retire from the bench. Resolve in your own mind that God is judge, you're not, and he will judge people. Pray for them. Help them. Give to them. Do good to them. Bless them. All the things that God tells us to do, because in doing so, you become part of the solution in somebody else's life. Just like Jesus, who died on the cross, so that we might be made right with God, and he took all of our sin upon himself, so that we might be able to live this life. 